So since we don't have the M2 Pro and the M2 Max chips just yet, however, we do have some amazing offers on the M1 Pro and the M1 Max MacBook Pros. For example, for Black Friday, you can get the 14-inch M1 Pro base model for $1,500 renewed, so $500 off. The question is, should you actually get one now? Well, this is my very own 14-inch MacBook Pro. This has been my main and my only Mac for the past one year and one month, and I've been using it basically every single day for 10 hours during the week and uh, between four to five or so during the weekend. So I've gotten some insane amount of usage out of this. So I'm gonna give you my thoughts and how this MacBook Pro lasted me over this period of one year. And I have five things to cover in this video. The wear and tear, uh, the issues, the things that I was wrong about, the things that I was right about at the beginning. And finally, should you actually get one? Starting off with the wear and tear. Where have I used this MacBook Pro? Well, I've used it at home, in my office, at coffee shops, in remote working places, airports and airplanes, train stations and trains, hotels, basically everywhere, including outdoors, on some tables, on rare occasions. And in terms of the overall wear and tear, I would say it lasted me pretty good. Although, I have had some slight issues though. For example, I've had quite some keyboard wear. Essentially, some of the keys have become glossy. Uh, this is because of the oil in my skin and through excessive use, uh, some of the keys have become like this. Unfortunately, this is permanent. It's something normal that happens to every single laptop after a few months of use. It cannot be fixed and in time, all the keys will be like this, although that might take a few years. I also have a couple of small scuffs all over the body and when I bumped it into things accidentally, although nothing major. But the biggest one is on the left hand side where the space gray anodization um, is coming off, revealing the silver underneath. This has actually been caused by my Apple Watch and its Milanese loop. So if you do have an Apple Watch or any watch with a metal band, keep this in mind, it will scratch your MacBook unless you have the silver model. But yeah, aside from this, I haven't really had any other wear and tear issues, so I would say that it actually held up really well for me, considering my use. I've also opened it up, but only once to clean up the fans, and they weren't as dusty as I was expecting. And number two, issues. And I've actually only had two issues for this past year, with my first one being the battery life, and this has been my biggest issue with this laptop by far. So during the week, I mostly keep it in the office at my desk, plugged in all the time. On weekends though, that's when I use it fully on battery power in coffee shops uh, to do remote work. And that's where I've been actually struggling with this. I'm only getting about four to five hours of light work with this machine. And that means just web browsing, calendar, Trello, emails, um, not much else. So I always need to carry a charger with me, always. So what I've actually been doing to kind of solve this issue is to enable low power mode when I'm on battery. What this does, aside from lowering the brightness, is that it limits the refresh rate of the screen to just 60 Hz as opposed to 120 Hz. So everything just feels slower and more laggy also because of the chip. So instead of all cores being used, uh, mostly the efficiency cores will be used for all the tasks. And because we only have two efficiency cores as opposed to four on the M2 chip, uh, or also four on the M1 chip, yeah, it, it doesn't feel as smooth. It feels quite slow and, and quite lagging. So why is this? Why is the battery life on my MacBook Pro so poor? Well, it's because of two reasons. Number one, I'm using the M1 Max model with 32 GPU cores, which consumes more power. And in the 14 inch, we don't actually have a larger battery with this configuration. So that's why it lasts less than the M1 Pro base model. And then two, I actually have a pretty poor battery health. Apple's reporting a battery health of just 86% after one year of use, which is really poor. And then Coconut Battery is actually reporting this as even lower, 82.4% with 208 cycles. Now, it might be that me using it mostly plugged in during the week is what actually caused it uh, to drop this heavily. But then at the same time, Apple does actually have this feature, optimized battery charging, which pauses charging once the battery reaches 80% to actually um, save it in the long run. However, this seems to be glitched because for me, it never really worked. Every single time I'm in the office, it charges to 100%. And my second issue has been in terms of the weight and the thickness. So I've been using a MacBook for the past 11 years. Before this, I've had um, the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro. And uh, going from this to the 14 inch has been a major downgrade in both thickness and uh, weight. So this has been significantly less portable than my old 13 inch M1 was. The funny thing here is that a 13 inch M1 is actually thicker on paper than the 14 inch. 
but seeing both in person, it actually gives you the impression that it is thinner uh, because of this form factor, which was really, really thin towards the edges, and then it got thicker uh, towards the bottom. And this gap actually made it much easier to lift from the table, which is something that I dearly miss from the M1. Uh, I just cannot do this <laughs> with the 14 inch. It feels like a tank. Now, don't get me wrong, it is still very portable. I just miss the thinness and the lighter weight of the previous generation, but you do get a lot of performance uh, because of that, so it does make sense. More about my experience with a 14-inch Mago Pro right after this. Okay, so I've talked about Clean My Mac before. It's a tool that I use multiple times a week to keep my Mac running smooth and also clear up space for when I need it. My favorite feature has to be Smart Scan a very clever single button that allowed me to speed up my editor's 2019 iMac when it was running abnormally slow. The built-in malware removal tool scans our machines for potential viruses, adware, and browser intrusions. And Cleaner Mac is also great for maintaining optimal speeds for our Macs by freeing up RAM, disabling unnecessarily login items, and system cache. There's also this fantastic new menu app, a smart dashboard, which allows you to monitor every aspect of your Mac's performance. On top of all of this, the award-winning design makes it one of the nicest apps to use. Check out the link below for an exclusive offer. And now, back to the video. Number three, the things that I was wrong about. So in our initial videos after the first two weeks, I had some thoughts. Now, some of my thoughts were right, but some of my thoughts proved to be very wrong. And I want to start with the ones that were wrong. The first one is getting the M1 Max. So I got the maxed out model, the unbent M1 Max with 32 GPU cores, 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage. My thought process was this. I simply love the 13 inch M1. My only issue with it was that it did not have dual monitor support, which I needed for work. The 14 inch did have dual monitor support that also had a new design, which I knew that Apple won't update this design for another six years or so. So I got a top spec model to last me until the next redesign. The problem is that I rarely needed the M1 Max's performance. I've rendered like two or three thumbnails and key shots. My team did the rest. I've edited our shorts, but now I've actually hired a new editor for the shorts, so no need to do that. The only demanding things that I've done recently would be Photoshop occasionally and Lightroom also occasionally. And everyone knows that you simply don't need an M1 Max for that. That's why my battery ended up being so poor because of the M1 Max. Uh, it was also very expensive, so a binned M1 Pro would have actually been perfect for me. And the second thing that I was really wrong about is MagSafe. Initially, I said that I would never use it, as I would simply travel with just one single USB-C cable. I wouldn't need MagSafe, but I was actually wrong because I've used it every single time. This turned out to be great for coffee shops where you just don't want to risk people stepping over your cable. Plus, it's also quite long and also very easy and small to carry around. And since I also pair it with a 100 watt charger, I'm also getting fast charging 50% in 30 minutes uh, on my MacBook Pro, which is great, especially considering my poor battery life. By the way, I absolutely love this charger. It's got four ports and this is the one that I always travel with. Not sponsored, but if you're interested in picking one of these up, the link is in the description. Now, in terms of the things that I was actually right about, the first one is the notch. I wasn't a fan from the very start, and one year later, I'm still not a fan. And it's not necessarily because of its design, as what I usually do is I use darker wallpapers, and then sometimes I also use apps such as Top Notch, which simply add this black bar on top of the wallpaper uh, to kind of blend the notch in. The main reason why I just don't like it is because I use a lot of third-party apps most of which have icons in the menu bar, which are just not visible because of the notch. So my solution is to use an app such as Bartender, but even that's not amazing because I don't know, it simply adds this pop-up menu on the bottom and it's just not as great as this would have been with the notch not being present at all. The second thing that I was right about is the HDMI port. I thought that I'd never use it and uh, yeah, <laughs> I've never used it. Not even once. And that's because whenever I wanted to uh, output something to a monitor, I just streamed it. So I didn't have to use it, but I guess it's still good to have for some people. And then the third thing that I was right about is the RAM. So whenever I research for a video, I have like 30 tabs or more open. So yeah, I'm quite messy with my tabs. I have Slack, Twitter open, Mail, Calendar 2, sometimes even Photoshop. And I always found that the 16 gigabytes of RAM on my M1 13 inch was just not cutting it. So that's why I've configured this with 32 gigabytes, which for me has been perfect. So I would highly recommend doing this 
If you're like me and you have tons of tabs open and apps open, I think 32 would make a huge difference. So now, finally, should you get one considering all of these recent deals and Black Friday offers? Well, I think that unless you really need the M1 Max, I would avoid it. I would simply get the base M1 Pro model as it is much cheaper and it also has much better battery life. The base model is simply a no-brainer. It costs $1,500 renewed or $1,700 from Apple refurbished. Plus, you also get a $250 gift card for Black Friday if you buy it from Apple. That's the same price as the M2 MacBook Air with 512 gigabytes of storage, but still 8 gigabytes of RAM. And the 14-inch MacBook Pro is a much better choice. You get significantly more performance, way better speakers, a much better display with mini LED, 120Hz, more ports, dual monitor support, and so much more. All of this makes the 14-inch MacBook Pro the best value MacBook that you can buy in terms of everything. Quality, performance, features, everything. So yes, I would 100% recommend it if you get the right model. But let me know your thoughts if you've used this for a long time. I'm Daniel, this is Enough Tech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. This is Enough Tech, signing out. Cheers.